May God teach you the meaning of that name, Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, it is wisdom's mystery, God with us. Sages look at it and wonder. Angels desire to see it. The plumb line of reason cannot reach halfway into its depths. The eagle wings of science cannot fly so high, and the piercing eye of the vulture of research cannot see it. God with us. It is hell's terror. Satan trembles at the sound of it. His legions fly apace. The black-winged dragon of the pit quails before it. Let Satan come to you suddenly and do you but whisper the word, God with us, and back he falls, confounded and confused. Satan trembles when he hears that name. God with us. It is the laborer's strength. How could he preach the gospel? How could he bend his knees in prayer? How could the missionary go into foreign lands? How could the martyr stand at the stake? How could the confessor acknowledge his master? How could men labor if that one word were taken away? God with us is the sufferer's comfort is the balm of his woe, is the alleviation of his misery, is the sleep that God gives to his beloved, is the rest after exertion and toil. God with us is eternity's sonnet, is heaven's hallelujah, is the shout of the glorified, is the song of the redeemed, is the chorus of angels, and is the everlasting oratorio of the great orchestra of the sky. God with us. God with us. Emmanuel is that word, God with us. Emmanuel is a word that is the, the pinhead of expression, of fulfillment of prophecies throughout the Old Testament. Emmanuel is a word, God with us is a word that is an expression of fulfillment of prophecies God has been making since Genesis 1.1. Emmanuel is an expression of the prophecies of God about a coming Messiah. In the same way that Emmanuel is a general fulfillment of prophecies to us, Emmanuel is also a reminder that God fulfills prophecies for us as individuals. The same way God has fulfilled prophecies to the world through His Scriptures. God has given some of you promises and, and, and me and all believers. He's given us promises. And He will fulfill them just as sure as He fulfilled Emmanuel. He will fulfill them in your lives. If God can fulfill something as difficult as a Savior come to earth, how much easier is it to fulfill individual prophecies and promises in your life? If He's already done the hardest, how much more likely is it, is it that He will do the easiest in your lives? And in mind, folks, the reality is God comes through. God comes through. God comes through on prophecies and promises He has declared today. I want to take a look at this very idea that God comes through. 
If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to the book, first of all, of Hosea, in the midst of the minor prophets of the Old Testament. And that always takes a few moments to get turned to because those little minor prophets are just a few pages long. But go to Hosea and mark your place in Hosea 11 and then find Matthew 2 and mark your place there also. Hosea chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 2 as we finish this final message in a series called I Told You So. Those prophets of the Old Testament could have stood there in Bethlehem and looked around at everybody and said, we told you so. And, and as they did, I will guarantee you this, I study those Old Testament prophecies for a lot of reasons. None the least of which is to remind me that if God can fulfill prophecies like that, how much more is He going to fulfill easy promises in my individual life? If he brought together governments and nations and people and cultures and brought them all together with a billion different details just to fulfill a single prophecy, which he fulfilled more, how much more will he bring together the individual events of my life to fulfill promises to me? And so this very day, let's be reminded that God always comes through. Mary and Joseph proceeded to Bethlehem according to Luke 2. Don't turn there, just listen. Mary and Joseph proceeded to Bethlehem according to Luke 2 in order to be counted in a census. The more things change, the more they stay the same. The Roman government was taking a census not just because they liked to count people, but because they wanted to make sure they were taxing everybody they needed to tax. And so things don't, haven't changed all that much, have they? Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem. She was about nine months pregnant. She had a baby in Bethlehem as they participated in a worldwide census. God literally moved the entire world just to get one couple to Bethlehem. And as we studied last week, the reason God got Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem is because the Old Testament prophet and Micah said they, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. If the Old Testament prophet had said he will be born in Kathmandu, they would have gotten him there. But the fact is, the Old Testament prophet said the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. God got him there. The baby was born. But there was another prophecy that we find in the book of Hosea. It was a time of incredible world events. Their location changed, their destination changed, their experience changed, yet God fulfilled the prophecy. How many of you believe that Mary and Joseph were planning to take a two- or three-day journey away from their hometown when she was nine months pregnant? How many of you think that maybe in the midst of their, their journey to Bethlehem, which they had to take, or they would have been in big trouble with the Roman government... How many of you think that along the way they might have been thinking, God, I thought you were going to take care of us. Could it have just slipped through their minds that what, what, what in the world is happening? None of this was supposed to take place. She was pregnant in Nazareth. All of her family, all the people around her that she would have needed to deliver a baby. I mean, ladies, your doctors won't even let you go several hours away in your ninth month anymore, let alone take an over-the-road walking trip two or three days away. And how many of you think that in the middle of that trip they might have thought, what in the world is going on? And as they arrived in Bethlehem, the baby was born. And according to Luke 2, it said Mary thought a lot about these things. And then another event took place some months later. Here's what was happening. Mary and Joseph, in order to participate in the census, uh, set up shop in Bethlehem. That was not their hometown. Their hometown was Nazareth. But they set up shop in Bethlehem. They found them a, a little house, I suppose, to rent. Joseph was a carpenter. The nice thing about that is that trade transfers. <laughs> so he could set up shop and do some carpentry in Bethlehem the same way he did in Nazareth. And as they began their, their time there, some men showed up along the way literally months later. Now, I realize in our modern-day nativity scenes, you've got Mary and Joseph. You've got the baby in the manger. You've got the little barn over it. You've got the shepherds over here, and you've got the wise men. Now, it's a lovely scene, but it is not thoroughly biblical. According to 
the passage that we'll look at today, what you find is that there were some wise men who showed up literally months later. Some say even up to a year or two, I believe several months after Jesus was born. And when they showed up there, something took place. Some amazing thing took place that fulfilled a prophecy that came all the way out of the book of Hosea. Now, I've got to tell you, the last book in the world you think of when you think of Christmas is Hosea. Hosea was a prophet of God who was told to go marry a woman who was a prostitute. Now, that did not establish marriage doctrine, believe me. But for that time and that place, God told Hosea to go marry a woman who he knew would be unfaithful. Hosea went and married her. And she did what unfaithful people do. She was unfaithful. In fact, she went off and ended up uh, in in a situation where Hosea literally had to go buy her back. You fill in the blanks. And people began to ask Hosea, Hosea, why in the world would you do this? Why would you marry this woman who's unfaithful and then go get her and bring her back when you could have her stoned to death? Hosea said, let me tell you why I'm doing this. Because God is using my life as a living example of what you're doing to him. The unfaithfulness she's shown to me is no worse than the unfaithfulness you're showing to God. What a sermon, right? But in the midst of the sermon, as you move toward the end of Hosea, this is the beauty of the minor prophets of the Old Testament. As hard as they are many times, and as scalding and as rebuking as they are many times, you go to the end of every minor prophet, and here's what you find. You find hope, you find redemption, you find repentance, and you find a future. And in Hosea chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, Hosea says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That launches us, folks, into our thoughts for the morning. We're going to consider some steps to fulfillment God brings about when he fulfills his prophecy. Listen, some steps to fulfillment God brings about when he fulfills the promise in your life. There are some steps that we'll see here. It's not every step. It's not an exhaustive list of steps. But it is a few steps God will bring about many times when He fulfills a prophecy and maybe a promise. And I would just say this before I move on. Some of you are sitting here today and you are thinking about something you believe God's shown you, you believe God's told you, or maybe it's very clearly there in the Scriptures like, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, right? Like, I I began a good work in you and I will be faithful to complete it till the day of Christ Jesus. And you're sitting there saying, I know God promised me this, but at this point in my life, it feels like it's as far away as it's ever been. My prayer is that you will leave here today with a greater confidence and the ability of God to fulfill promises in your life than when you walked in the door. And so it begins here in in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, with what I call the declaration of the event. The declaration of the event. He says again, when Israel was a child, this is Hosea preaching, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. This verse means it's two different levels. Two different levels. First, Hosea is looking back. He's looking back from when Joseph ended up sold into slavery in Egypt, rose to the second most powerful man in the world, brought his family to Egypt to take care of them. A new, a, a new Pharaoh came into, into being in Egypt. And that Pharaoh did not know Joseph's family. And so he began to enslave the Israelites because they were becoming so numerous, right? Right? And they were enslaved for 400 years when God brought a deliverer, a man named Moses, who stuttered and had really very little ability to do what he ultimately did. Moses, the most humble man in the world, he went to Pharaoh and after 10 plagues had taken place, finally God's people were released and they came out of Egypt, correct? And that, Hosea, is referencing. Hosea says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. Him referencing the nation of Israel. And out of Egypt I called my son. And so there is a prophecy being declared here. You say, Pastor Johnny, what does that have to do with Jesus? Well, it would probably have to do nothing with Jesus except for the fact that in just a moment you're going to see when we get to Matthew 2, 
Matthew says that verse out of Hosea was not only a reference back to the Israelites being delivered from Egypt, it was also a reference forward to the Messiah who would come out of Egypt. Pastor Johnny, how did that happen? We're going to see in just a moment. But it begins right here with a declaration of the event. God can take one thing, in this case, this verse, when it appears to be referring to the Israelites coming out of Egypt, right? God can take one thing and make it do many things. Many times, those various ways that God works among us, He does things outside of those that we would never even consider. See, here's what we do. We look at our situation and we can only see about 18 inches in front of our face. And we're certain that whatever takes place next has got, to, has got to happen within my scope of understanding of things. And if it doesn't happen A, B, or C, then I don't know what's going to happen. And then when it doesn't happen A, B, or C, we're certain that it's not going to happen or that we're not sure we're doing right or we don't know what's going on. And here's what we forget. God can take one thing and He can do 20 things with it that we've not ever even considered. So when Hosea declared this, Uh, When Israel was a child, I loved him out of Egypt. I called my son. And that day, the Israelites were certainly thinking of when their ancestors had been delivered out of Egypt. But what they may not have conceived of, and what many didn't conceive of, was that he was also speaking of a Messiah who who would be released and come out of Egypt hundreds of years later. How many of you know that when God's working in your life, there are things he can do that you never even thought of? and you're wrestling and complaining and struggling and agitated and irritated and discouraged because all you can see is right here and it's never even crossed your mind that there are things happening you can't even see and don't even know about that are for your good. About seven years ago, we had been at Green Acres about six months. The second time, I like to say. I was youth pastor here back for a couple of years around 2000. Left and came back in 05, and about six months after we were here, I had someone who I was talking to about compost piles. How many of you here have a compost pile at your homes? Okay, a few, a few brave souls. So um, we were talking about it, and I decided I would at least take a stab at it. I'm not a gardener, nor do I claim to be, nor do I think I should be. Um, I got plenty of people around here who grow stuff, who bring me things, so I don't have to grow things, and that's awfully nice. But I went home and I had grass clippings and, and pumpkin rinds and watermelon rinds. And I had a corner right at the back uh, point of where our property came into to a, a little area. And I just started dumping stuff. And I don't really think I did the compost pile like you're supposed to. I think you're supposed to turn those things and they smell bad and all kinds of stuff. I just started dumping stuff back there. And so I'm figuring with all the grass clippings and the mulch and the stuff that's going on there... Over time, maybe I can use that as fertilizer. And so for, for me, that it was, a, uh, it was something that was good for the environment and it could be good for my bushes later on. Now, my, my, my philosophy of yard work is make it as easy as possible. All right? So that, that's just kind of the, the way I am. I want it to look good, but with as little effort as possible. So, so I put the stuff in, the, in that corner and over the course of time, I went back there one day and I noticed something funny. a a vine was growing up out from that pile of stuff. It started growing pumpkins, believe it or not. You know what happened? This pile that I thought might be good for fertilizer and might be good for the environment did something for me I never even thought of. It provided me some pumpkins. I'm not sure if we ever used those pumpkins, but it provided me pumpkins. Now, I know that's a trite explanation and a trite illustration, but here's the reality. Some of us have got all this stuff in our pile of life that we're looking at and we're wrestling with, and we think nothing can happen outside of this, and God's over here growing us this vine we haven't even thought about. Well, we're over here wrestling with experiences and all that we can think about, and we think we've got it all figured out. It's not working out right, and God's saying, you don't even see that I'm growing you something over here that's good for you, that's best for you, and you don't even realize it. Folks, listen, when God declares a promise in your life, don't assume that He will fulfill it the way you think that He should. There's a declaration of an event, and you may be facing an overwhelming situation. And you may have gotten to a point of frustrating, being frustrated with God. And it may not even be clear what God's doing. 
or, or maybe it is clear. Maybe it's very clear to you. Or maybe it's not. <laughs> but make no mistake about it. When God declares something, He will fulfill it. It's just that He may be doing something over here to the side that you didn't realize. When Hosea declared that promise, wonder how many Israelites who heard it even thought about the Messiah. wonder how many had even crossed their minds. Probably few, if any. Not even knowing that he was talking about the good news that would come hundreds of years later. Not knowing that he was talking about one who would come years later. That even in 2012 at Green Acres Baptist Church we'd be talking about it. There's no way he could have conceived of that. So then, the declaration of the event. Then there is the danger around the experience of that event. Flip over to Matthew 2. In Matthew 2... Verses 1 all the way down through 15. We see a story. And that story culminates with a guarantee that Hosea's words in Hosea 11.1 1 were actually referencing in part this event in Jesus' life. And let me just give you a summary. Sometime after Jesus was born, as he'd grown up and gotten a little older, some months later... Mary and Joseph were living in Bethlehem, and some men showed up in town. Some magi, if you will, magicians, men who followed the stars, astrologers, but men who were powerful where they came from. They came from an area of Mesopotamia that is today modern-day Iraq. It's where Babylon uh, came out of, and Persia, and Assyria, and all those nations. Many believe that that area is actually where the world began, and if we were to trace back the Garden of Eden, it would probably be somewhere around in that area. And so these men traveled far. They were not Jewish. They were not followers of God. They traveled far and showed up to look at Jesus. And as they traveled, they they thought that it might be a good idea to stop by and talk to the local political leaders to find out where this baby that they had been looking for was. As they stopped to talk to Herod, we'll see here in just a few moments, Herod became aware that there was this baby being born, being referred to as a king, and as any good paranoid megalomaniac would do, he became disturbed that these men were looking for another king that wasn't him. And so he told them to find out where the baby was and to come back and let him know. Of course, he was, did not have good will or good intentions for this baby. These magi showed up, wealthy men. They gave expensive gifts to the baby Jesus. And then when they left, they went another direction. And when Herod found out that these men had tricked him, he set out to start killing baby boys in and around Bethlehem. Now, the, quite frankly, I think sometimes we think there were thousands and thousands. Remember, Bethlehem was really a very small town. There probably weren't that many baby boys that he had to kill. But prior to that happening, Mary and Joseph uh, got word in a dream to go off to Egypt and to stay there until further notice, and they did. And when they got further notice, they came out of Egypt, and so to fulfill the prophecy of Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, out of Egypt I called my son. Think about it. God moved three astrologers, uh, three magicians, three powerful men from a nation far away to show up in Bethlehem to trigger a chain of events that would force Jesus to go to Egypt just so he could fulfill a prophecy spoken in Hosea 11.1. Now watch this. In verse 1 of Matthew chapter 2, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying... Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him, which means to bow down. Very, very unusual that they would, these men in their stature and their status would seek to bow down to a baby boy, in this case, who was socially, culturally inferior to them. And yet that was their goal. Verse 3, Then Herod, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled And that word trouble means to agitate or to stir. Stir is oftentimes the word used to refer to to waves or ripples in a lake. You throw a rock in and the ripples come. That's how Herod felt emotionally at this point. Verse 4, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired or demanded of them where the Christ was to be born. 
So they said to him, verse 5, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Another fulfillment of prophecy, by the way, that we looked at last week. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star had appeared. Of course, the wise men at this point, the magi, the the astrologers, they did not realize they were doing anything wrong. In fact, they weren't doing anything wrong. They were doing exactly what God intended. On the outside, it looks wrong, doesn't it? Because they're spilling the beans. But the reality is this is what God intends because He's going to get Jesus to Egypt. Why does He want to get Jesus to Egypt? Because Hosea said the Messiah would come out of Egypt. That's why. And so in verse 8, And He sent them to Bethlehem and said, "Go Go and search carefully or examine, examine thoroughly for the young child. When you have found him, bring him back word to, or bring back word to me that I may come and worship him. Also, we know by, by the, the verses that come later, as Herod had no such plan in mind, he didn't plan to worship him, he planned to kill him. And so as he's talking to the wise men, Herod being extremely crafty, he is able to tell them, when you find him, bring back word to me because I want to worship him. Now just for a moment, think about the level of, the, the, the level of imitation Herod would have had to make of someone who really cared about Jesus. Th- think about the level of seriousness on his face. Uh, th- this man was a true politician, was he not? He could stand there and tell you he loves you to your face while he's talking to someone in the background who's going to kill you and assassinate you, right? He, he's standing there looking in your face with a straight face, with honest care on his face, to the degree that the wise men actually thought he really cared. And so verse 9, When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And this word child is paideia. There are different words for child in in, in the Greek language, much the same way as we have in English. Uh, If I say that child is a newborn, We have a basic idea about the age, the size, the development of that child, right? If I say that child is an infant, we have a a basic idea. If I say that child is a toddler, basic idea. Preschooler, adolescent, teenager. And all these words are referenced to, to kids, all to children, and yet they refer to different levels of development. Well, in the Greek language, there are also those words. And paideia was referring to a child, not a newborn, Not an infant, but a child who had grown up some months. And so we can assume then when they showed up to see Jesus, he was at least four, six, eight, maybe ten months old at this point. And here's what we know. Whether Mary and Joseph knew it or not, he was in great, great danger. Make no mistakes. If God has established a promise, listen to me, folks, he will bring it to pass. But could I suggest to you that he may walk you through some very dangerous waters as he brings you to the fulfillment? Could I suggest to you that you may be in a difficult time and situation and you're concerned as to whether God will bring that thing to pass? Fear not. The fear, the experience of bringing the promise to pass may seem dangerous. But make no mistake, he will. You look through the scriptures and find all the people who saw promises fulfilled and yet the danger they walked through to get there. I began to think of the Apostle Paul and how God declared to Paul in Acts chapter 9 that he would make him the apostle to the Gentiles and he would go and to preach to all kinds of nations. And yet if you go back and look at Paul's life, you see him uh, right after he gets saved, preaching in Jerusalem and in a village, they have to let him down outside the walls in a basket because he is in such danger. And his life is hanging by a thread because people are chasing him. And then another time where he's preaching and they take him outside the walls and stone him thinking they've killed him. And at that point people may be thinking, I thought this was going to be the preacher to the Gentiles. He can't even make it out of this town alive on his first missionary journey. And yet he stands up and walks back in and keeps trucking down the road. 
And another time, people chasing him out of town, trying to kill him. His life is in danger. And another time, he's thrown into jail in Philippi just for preaching the gospel. And on and on and on. And by the end of the book of Acts, he's taken to Rome, put in a prison. His life hangs in the balance. And we're wondering, he, he, he is almost dead, and yet God said he would be the preacher to the Gentiles. You say, well, Pastor Johnny, that came to fulfillment. In the, in the New Testament, did it not? Yes, and it's still being fulfilled because how many of Paul's letters have we used to preach to this congregation of Gentiles? Make no mistake about it. If God offers you a promise, bringing that promise to fulfillment will often mean a whole lot of danger to that promise. Even times where it seems like there's no way the promise could work. God's given you a plan for your future, He may walk you through some awfully dangerous times. Parents with your children, teenagers up to adulthood, husbands with your wives, wives with your husbands. There may be a promise God has given you, and He's working out His plan. It just may be that right now things seem awfully dangerous, and so they are. So how about the danger around the experience of fulfillment? doesn't matter because God comes through. Or how about people around you and the devotion from their eyewitness accounts? Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 10. When they, the the Magi, saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Each of these gifts has a special purpose. But let me just wrap it up with this. They are very, very valuable. Each of them. Healing qualities. Decorative qualities. I mean, very valuable gifts. Just remember that. Don't forget that. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. These magi had no idea what they were about to get into. And look in the course of of the experience, look now at their devotion. God had Jesus in Bethlehem because He was fulfilling a prophecy, yes, but also because He was going to bless the Magi. And how many of you think the Magi went all the way back home and didn't tell people about this baby? How many of you think the Magi went all the way back to Mesopotamia, thousands of miles away? How many of you think they went back and didn't talk to somebody about it? How many of you think they didn't become evangelists in their own country after the experience they had had? And how many of you know that when God gives you a promise, it's not just about you. He may fulfill that promise in a way that blesses eyewitnesses who are all around you. And He may actually bring people to Christ by the way He fulfills that promise in your life. It's not just about you. So how about the way... Eyewitnesses become devoted to Christ just because of the way God fulfills a promise in your life. Now, you may not like the way He's fulfilling it, but could I suggest to you that it's not really primarily about you or me? In 1906, author O. Henry, which was a pen name for William Sidney Porter, he wrote a famous short story called The Gift of the Magi. Anybody read that? Anybody seen it? Great short story. If you haven't read it, Take a look at it this Christmas. The gift of the Magi. Quite frankly, there are no Magi in the story, but watch this. The story is about a gentleman named Mr. James Dillingham Young. He goes by Jim in the story. His wife, Della, they they are a a young couple, a poor couple living in a little flat, which is a small apartment because they had very little money. They each have one possession that they take very, very seriously and take great pride in. Della's possession is her beautiful, long, flowing hair, which comes down almost to her knees. Jim is his shiny gold watch that was handed all the way down from his grandfather. On Christmas Eve, Della has a dollar and eighty-seven cents in hand and goes out desperately trying to find her husband, her love, a gift. As they gather together Christmas morning, Jim discovers that Della has sold her hair for $20 to buy him a a gold watch chain to go for his watch. Where Jim, in turn, had sold his gold watch 
to buy some beautiful hair combs for her hair. And so there they sit, each with a gift that they can no longer use because they sold the thing it would pertain to to buy the other a gift. And they realize that they have something much greater than the gifts in their hands. They have something meant for someone else. They had given themselves away to someone else. And here's the, the last paragraph of the story. It says this. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the newborn king of the Jews in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that all of you, all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are wisest, everywhere they are wisest, they are the magi, those who gave gifts outside of themselves. Make no mistake, as God's fulfilling a promise in your life, imagine how He might impact the lives of eyewitnesses around you the way He's fulfilling it in your life. The wise men became devoted as eyewitnesses. And then finally, as God fulfills this promise, this prophecy. Look at verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. Let me ask you a question. How many of you know it's expensive to travel? How many of you know it's always been expensive to travel? You don't always have food with you that you can prepare. You might have to buy food along the way. You can't, you can't carry enough. Now, you, you don't have a map up here to see the geographical space that they would have had to travel from Bethlehem all the way to Egypt. It was an expensive trip. How in the world did they pay for that trip? Could it have been that God moved three astrologers from thousands of miles away to show up randomly? and bring gifts that would afford them the opportunity to travel to Egypt, to get out of trouble, and have the money to do it. This is a sovereign God. Yes. Folks, there is drama in the fulfillment of your promise. There may be drama in the fulfillment of what God's promised you, but I promise you, God comes through. Amen. In verse 15, And there was until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son, he fulfilled his promise. He fulfilled the prophecy. Yes, there was drama in the episode, but he fulfilled the promise. Now let me suggest to you something. You're here today. You're here today. And you're struggling with some area of your life. And it's really difficult because you're not certain. Maybe I've done something wrong. Maybe I miss God. Now, now you're no longer blaming God, but you're saying, well, maybe I've done something wrong. Could I suggest to you that God is sovereign enough to reveal himself to you? Could I suggest to you that if God's given you a promise in your life, He is able to fulfill it? It is not dependent upon you. It is dependent upon Him. Maybe it's time we stop thinking that the fulfillment of a promise is all about what I do or don't do. But maybe the fulfillment of God's promise to me and His prophecy to me is that I look to Him and trust Him. If you learn anything from the wise men in this whole story, know this, God comes through. But Pastor Johnny, it's been a year. It's been five years. It's been ten years. What is that to God? It's been six months. It's been ten months. It just seems like it's not happening. What is that to God? God comes through. And here's what I'm going to do. In just a few moments, I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up. In fact, right now, I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up. And I want you to hear me. There are some of you sitting here today, and you need to respond in obedience right now. Don't lose me now. You need to respond in obedience here in just a few moments. And there's something God's put on your heart and you've been, you, you, you've been weary and you've been shaken in your faith. And you need to come today and just get before the Lord and say, Lord, give me a fresh picture of you. Because I know that when I can see you, I'll be reminded you come through. Maybe you need to come today and say, Pastor Johnny, I've never given my heart and life to Christ. I really don't know about God coming through because I've never given my life to Him. And today's the day you want to come and say, Pastor Johnny, can you show me how to know this God who always comes through in His Son, Jesus Christ? You come today. 
And maybe it is that some of you are praying and you're in your 12th month, 12th year, 15th year, third year of praying and you're, you're just convinced God has put on you a desire heart or maybe it's some scripture that He's given you and you're praying through it and you become a little weary. Can I remind you of something? God comes through. Pray with me. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray that your people would respond. I pray that those who aren't your people yet would respond. And Lord, right now, that you would work in our hearts and that we would obey you with every ounce of our being. We would obey you. And Lord, whether it is that you want them to come and pray, whether it is you want them to find someone to pray with, to give their lives to Christ, Lord, whatever step of obedience it is right now you desire. Maybe it is someone who needs to come and be a part of this church body and become a part of what you're doing here, the promises you've given this church. Lord, whatever that is, I pray that right now, We would obey in Jesus' name. Why don't you stand as we sing? You stand.